Prepare for takeoff. Extreme aircraft of all kinds are maneuvering for position in the skies of the 21st century. From a fighter jet straight out of Star Wars, and a supersonic bomber that thinks it's a fighter, to miniature eyes in the skies, personal-sized flying machines, and jumbo jets that would blow away Smokey the Bear. Now, Extreme Aircraft 2 on Modern Marvels. Station 4 at Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth, Texas. The future of aerial combat is preparing for flight. This is the F-35A, a variant of the F-35 Lightning II, arguably the most extreme fighter jet in the world. With a fully loaded weight capacity of 68,000 pounds and a 35-foot wingspan, the F-35A is capable of hitting a maximum cruising speed of Mach 1.6. That's fast enough to zip from LA to New York in about two hours. The muscle that powers this supersonic jet is the largest single turbofan ever put in a fighter. The Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine. Back here at the aft end of the airplane, we have the propulsion system. It's a single engine aircraft one of the largest engines in a tactical fighter. This particular engine has 40,000 pounds of thrust. Essentially, in a 50,000 pound class aircraft, it's gonna be a pretty snappy performer. To equal the force of the F-135, you'd need the combined power of six top fuel dragsters at 7,000 horsepower each. Or the teamwork of 80 big rigs with 500 horsepower engines. The Lightning II also brings Ferrari-like finesse to its afterburner. Essentially a system that adds raw fuel to the exhaust for a boost of explosive thrust. The afterburner, unlike previous engines where they stage through various levels of thrust, is one smooth acceleration. It's just an incredible amount of thrust. It's an incredible rush to put it in the upper left-hand corner and uh, pull back on the stick and let it go. The F-135 engine delivers the bronze, but it's the brains that set this warbird apart. Its onboard computer processor can run more than one trillion operations per second. Key feature of the F-35 Lightning II is the integrated sensor suite. Starts up front here, an active electronically steered away radar able to simultaneously track air-to-air -air and air-to-ground threats and engage them. As we move back a little bit in this bay here, will be an electro-optical sensor able to track and engage targets on the ground as well as in the air using optical means rather than radar. Very, very good for stealth. Prior to flight, every F-35A test pilot puts in long hours on the simulator, learning how to master the computer-integrated cockpit. Some of the things that'll really blow you away, inside the cockpit, it's almost like having a Windows environment. The cockpit has an 8 by 20 inch panoramic cockpit display, all AM LCD just like your TV at home, touch screen. Despite the user friendly interface, most pilots prefer to keep their eyes on the actual target. For this reason, the F 35A comes with a helmet that would satisfy the pickiest Star Wars fighter pilot. This is the HMD, or helmet mounted display. When the visor is lowered, the pilot sees the skies as two electro-optical lenses project graphics directly onto the visor. Flight data and targeting information are literally in your face. No light, bad weather, he can see what others can't, which is very compelling if you're fighting in bad weather or at night. You can fight and see and the others cannot. The F-35A masterfully integrates the extreme features that define the modern fighter. Features pioneered by supersonic jets of the past. Case in point, 
the Lightning II's modified Delta Wing. It increases maneuverability because its leading edge remains behind the shockwave generated by the nose at supersonic speeds. In the 1960s, the Soviets were the first to use the tail Delta Wing on a supersonic fighter, on their MiG-21. During the Vietnam War, the tail Delta Wing enhanced the MiG's maneuverability, helping it level the playing field with the more powerful US F-4 Phantom II. The much larger Phantom carried eight guided missiles, the MiG only two. But like a lethal gnat, the Russian-built jet scored more than 40 air-to-air -air kills on US Phantoms. It was an American fighter that pioneered another feature that's crucial to the Lightning II's extreme performance. Its massive turbofan engine. Until the early 1960s, fighters came equipped with turbojet engines. Turbojets inject fuel to ignite compressed air. The resulting combustion drives a turbine that produces thrust. The F-111 Aardvark, unveiled in 1964, was the first fighter with a turbofan engine. A design incorporating an external fan, similar to a propeller, that provides added thrust with airflow that bypasses the jet engine, thus increasing power and fuel efficiency. The thrust of the F-111's two turbofans topped 50,000 pounds, three times the power of the first supersonic fighter, the F-100 Super Sabre. As sheer power like this helps the F-35A dominate the skies, its low observable profile, or stealth, helps hide it from enemy radar. The first interceptor jet with extreme stealth capabilities was the YF-12, first flown in 1962. It evolved from the same program that spawned the SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Each plane's wings featured surface angles designed to absorb and reflect radar, which significantly reduced their radar signatures. The Lightning II's classified stealth design is reputed to reduce its signature to the size of a golf ball. But stealth design isn't the only asset contained in the Lightning II's airframe. It's also compact, lightweight, and nimble. Aerodynamic Pluses pioneered in 1976 by the F-16 Fighting Falcon. The Falcon's power, combined with its sleek, small design, changed the physics of aerial combat, enabling pilots to turn more rapidly inside an opponent and lock missiles. The Falcon was the first fighter rated at sustained forces nine times the force of gravity, or nine Gs, the threshold at which all but the most seasoned pilots would black out. Most jet fighters before the F-16 were rated at only six Gs. At nine Gs, a 200-pound pilot weighs the equivalent of 1,800 pounds. The attributes of the F-16 were simply undeniable. And over a period of time, over 4,000 F-16s were built, and in fact, the type is still in production. A newer jet fighter that began production in 2003, the F-22 Raptor, featured the final element that became an integral part of the Lightning II. The Raptor came equipped with advanced integrated avionics, complex computer software that runs flight controls, weapons, and other onboard systems, freeing the pilot to concentrate on the battle. The combination of the F-22 and the F-35 together can tear down the walls of an opponent, open up the sky above them, and then make that opponent more vulnerable to conventional attacks. America's future fighter, the F-35 Lightning II, represents the culmination of 70-plus years of fighter trial and error. In fact, the F-35 is three fighters in one. It was originally called the Joint Strike Fighter because it was designed to jointly serve three branches of the military. Lockheed Martin will deliver the conventional F-35A to the Air Force. The F-35B is a short takeoff and vertical landing fighter 
designed for the Marine Corps. First demonstrated as the X-35B prototype. The F-35C is an aircraft carrier launch version for the U.S. Navy. We built three variants of this airplane, basically off the same airplane, kind of like the way car industry builds a family of SUVs and pickup trucks off the same chassis. Lockheed Martin's Fort Worth production facility is responsible for crafting all F-35 wings and forward fuselages. The crucial component on the fuselage of the F-35B is the vertical lift fan. And the key to this fifth generation airplane is just above my head. And what this is is the lift fan area. These are the vanes that direct the airflow. There's 19,000 pounds of thrust that will come out of this. 19,000 pounds in the rear. We have roll posts in the wing. They'll get about 1,900 pounds thrust each. And that allows this to come in for the vertical landing, also the short takeoff. It has doors on top that open up like an old 55 Chevy hood. The lift fan engages, so at 250 knots, the pilot comes in, engages the lift fan, opens the doors, the plane begins to slow down, transitions from airborne, wingborne flight to jetborne flight, and can almost, you know, land like a helicopter. The F-35 was a group effort, with the United States joining eight foreign nation partners. The various F-35 versions will have a commonality of parts, making the airframe far less expensive to build and fly than the F-22 Raptor. The F-35 represents the largest aerospace defense program in history. But some say it could be the fighter pilot's last ride. I would propose to this program as we sit here today that the F-35 potentially represents the last manned fighter. If it's not the end of the road for the manned uh, fighter, uh, it's getting awfully darn close. Flying state-of-the-art extreme fighters like the F-35 is one way to attack the enemy. Another is to load 25 tons of bombs into an aircraft with the engine power of three F-35s. The F-35 Lightning II is nearly 40% carbon fiber composite by weight, the most of any fighter in history. Extreme Aircraft II will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Extreme Aircraft II on Modern Marvels. At Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, the airmen of the 28th Bomb Wing are gearing up to go supersonic once again. Their mission? Take out a runway and some buildings in southeastern Montana. With orders in hand, they make the commute to the flight line. Their extreme aircraft is a bomber that thinks it's a fighter. It's called the B-1B Lancer. The men call it the Bone. The B-1B bomber is 146 feet long, weighs approximately 440,000 pounds fully loaded, and can reach supersonic speeds of Mach 1.2. The four General Electric turbofan engines produce 30,000 pounds of thrust each meaning the B-1 is powered by the equivalent of three F-35 fighter engines. The B-1 is a great aircraft to fly. We have the speed and uh, the capability to, uh, to make hard turns, transition from high altitude to low altitude very quickly in a dive. We have the speed and the legs to uh, really uh, just kind of turn and burn. One hour into the mission, the crew's target is within striking distance. In the aft compartment, 
the offensive systems officer prepares to unleash the bomber's fearsome payload. A sensitive radar with ground-moving target tracking helps pinpoint the target for destruction. Well, we're looking at you got a road running basically north-south. You got your runway here, and these bright returns right there are the uh, buildings that we'll be striking today. Right here, it's telling me I got 56 seconds to release. And I got three 2,000-pound weapons coming out on those buildings. Doors, forward and aft, coming open. Right here, you can see the map. Make sure the doors open. One away, two away, three and three away. The doors come closed. System safe, clear to maneuver. In this training mission over the farm fields of Montana, the bombs are simulations. But another day, this same crew may repeat this methodical and deadly process for real. If that happens, the B-1B will bring an overwhelming payload to the battle. Its three massive bomb bays carry a flexible arsenal. This includes smart weapons, bombs and guided missiles that use global positioning data to precisely destroy targets. Over the Middle East, the crews often deploy guided bombs, called JDAMs. Standing behind me here is the 180-inch rotary launcher, which is carrying the 2,000-pound joint direct attack munition. And each bomber holds three per bay, which is a total of 24 GPS-guided munitions. A single B-1B carries a weapons payload eight times heavier than that carried by a B-17 during World War II. And like fast food customers, the Bones weapons officers can have it their way. Uh, it can be almost like a Burger King. You know, I'll take a 500 pounder with an instantaneous fuse. Please give me a 20, a 2,000 pounder with a 25 millisecond fuse. And, and while you're at it, you know, can you send me a burger and fries? The B-1B continues to share mission duties with a relic of the Cold War, the B-52 bomber. They both carry a weapons payload in excess of 25 tons. But that's where the similarities end. I like to describe them like cars. Your B-52 is like your grandfather's pickup truck. It's old, it's reliable, and it carries just about anything you can imagine to carry. The, uh, the B-1 uh, is the muscle car of the bomber force. It has power, it has speed, and it has a huge payload capability. The B-1B can trace its muscle car beginnings to the early 1970s. The Air Force wanted to replace its aging B-52s with supersonic bombers that could quickly penetrate Soviet airspace with their nuclear arsenal. But since many politicians believed America's intercontinental ballistic missile program was a sufficient deterrent to the Soviets, they were convinced the proposed B-1A bomber was a colossal waste of money. So the Air Force basically found itself in a very difficult position trying to sell this new heavy bomber, and I might mention very expensive heavy bomber, to Congress. But over a period of time, they did succeed. The B-1A bomber prototypes could fly at Mach 2.2. But even at twice the speed of sound, they couldn't outrun numerous mechanical problems and cost overruns. And so the Carter administration, looking around to make cuts, they decided to cut back on the B-1A. And so the B-1A went away. Now, what people recognize is that the B-1A was really too good to go away. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. In 1981, when Ronald Reagan assumed the presidency, he immediately vowed to restore the punch to the U.S. military. That included reviving the B-1 program. Renamed the B-1B, a single bomber could deliver a payload of 24 B-61 nuclear bombs with a destructive capacity nearly 500 times that of the Hiroshima blast. But when the new bomber entered service in the late 1980s, it faced a sudden identity crisis. 
Well, as time has passed, and of course the Soviet threat has collapsed, you know, effectively the Air Force was faced with the dilemma, what do we do with the B-1 bomber? Since America no longer needed a long-range nuclear bomber, in the late 1990s, the Air Force began upgrading the B-1B to carry conventional weapons. Over the past decade, the retooled B-1B has become a workhorse of the U.S. bomber fleet. In six years of operations over Afghanistan and later in Iraq, B-1Bs have flown more than 2,200 sorties and dropped more than 7,400 bombs, far surpassing the B-52 and the B-2 stealth bombers. But the B-1B's greatest weapon may be its extreme agility, meaning the crews can sometimes avoid using bombs and still make a major impact on hostile forces below. They sometimes buzz the enemy by streaking at supersonic speeds as low as 200 feet off the ground. The sonic effect of the B-1B engines on the human ear is similar to a large conventional bomb blast. The key to this highly dangerous flight path is the bomber's autopilot. It employs a system called TF, or terrain following. When TF is engaged, the aircraft's radar scans forward up to 10 miles to create a map of the terrain. The plane uses the map to skim above the contours of the terrain without input from the pilot. Crews often use this low-level ground-hugging feature to awesome effect. Well, a show of force is really just to say, we're here, and a lot of times you can disperse the enemy or scare them into hiding and run them off before we have to use any kinetic tools, like a weapon. Collateral damage is very, very important to us, and we minimize that to the maximum extent. Whether it's a show force sortie or a tactical bomb strike, the B-1B pushes the limits of what a bomber can accomplish. Its capabilities make it extreme, the power makes it extreme, its flexibility makes it extreme. And if I were an enemy of the United States, the last thing I'd want to see is a B-1 coming at me. Extreme aircraft of another class can't deliver weapons or fly supersonic but their tiny camera lenses can create as much havoc as the largest bomb blast. Because of its sleek profile, the radar cross-section of a B-1B bomber is 100 times smaller than that of the B-52. Extreme Aircraft 2 will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Extreme Aircraft 2 on Modern Marvels. In the not-so-distant past, a single foot soldier had severely limited line-of-sight capabilities when scouting enemy positions. But with the help of a new class of extreme aircraft, one infantryman can have an eye in the sky that could help him take down a well-entrenched foe. Say cheese for the Batcam. It's a battery-powered micro-air vehicle, or MAV. With built-in video cameras that offer a bird's-eye view of anything within a range of nine miles. Its carbon fiber body is extremely lightweight, and it can be assembled and launched in seconds. The Batcam weighs in at a minuscule eight-tenths of a pound. Its wingspan is 20 inches, and max airspeed is approximately 51 miles per hour. A rugged notebook computer sends commands to the MAV and displays real-time video. The operator flies the drone remotely or commands it to fly autonomously to pre-programmed coordinates. 
It's a saying in the military, if you can't see it, you can't control it. And military operations is about controlling areas uh, for, for the most effective uh, type of uh, results. Rapid advances in miniaturization have enabled designers to produce an advanced generation of drones, as extreme as they are tiny. One of the primary challenges was to be able to find cameras that were small enough to be placed on the vehicle. So they had to be very small, plus they had to be very light. Our vehicles weigh on the order of uh, grams, not in terms of pounds. One military contractor, Applied Research Associates, evolved the BATCAM concept into an even more extreme microaircraft. We call this the Nighthawk. This aircraft is an improvement from our other aircraft. It has longer flight duration capability. It has an improved GPS. The update rate is higher, more sensitive. Along with improved range and higher resolution video cameras, the Nighthawk has a built-in thermal camera. The imager can detect heat signatures from personnel or vehicle engines. But the camera's added weight demands a super light airframe. The structural shell of the Nighthawk is made from carbon fiber epoxy. The fuselage, for instance, is made from a single piece, which makes it very rigid and durable. We have uh, a tail that is assembled on the aircraft, and it has built-in hinges for the control surfaces. And the, really the enabling uh, technology is the wing. The wing is also carbon fiber. It has ripstop nylon to enable it to be very flexible so it can roll up and store. In ongoing military operations, U.S. forces are deploying a swarm of extreme lightweight aircraft, like the WASP, used by the Air Force, the Cyberbug, preferred by the U.S. Navy, and the Raven, an all-around performer deployed by the U.S. Army and the Marines. Scientists at the Air Force Research Lab at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida are birdwatching for new inspiration. We call this biomimetic or bio-inspired systems. And one can look at an eagle, one can look at a conventional bird, one can look at a bat. At Oxford University in the UK, researchers mounted video cameras onto birds of prey in order to study their complex wing motions in flight. One prototype built by University of Arizona researchers takes the flapping wing concept into the nanosphere. The Ornithopter weighs a paltry one-third of an ounce. It has a five-inch wingspan and mylar membrane wings and a maximum flight time of three minutes. Scientists hope one day to deploy bird-like MAVs in urban areas with gusty, unpredictable wind patterns. But why flap when you can blast off? Though it looks like an Imperial probe droid from Star Wars, this MAV by the Honeywell Corporation is a true hover and stare drone. With a maximum altitude of 10,500 feet, it uses a fan propulsion system to hover and record more stable images than a fixed wing MAV. Its only limitation? With a 2.2 pound fuel supply, range is restricted to about six miles. A company called Light Machines is refining its vision of an urban reconnaissance MAV. It uses counter-rotating blades to hover, and it's aptly called Voyeur. This animation shows that the Voyeur system can fly forward of the other troops, provide the reconnaissance in a urban environment in order that they can detect potential threats and potential targets and relay that information back to the convoy before it can enter, before it enters the city. For soldiers in the field, this new army of micro-air vehicles is a quick way to gain the upper hand in a fight. 
But one day, these drones could become even more lethal. Potentially in the future, we can even use these as a system to uh, attack targets. It doesn't have to be as small as a bat cam or as large as a B-1 bomber to be an extreme aircraft. How about air vehicles that could make runways obsolete? In the 1970s, the CIA built a scale replica of a dragonfly called Insectothopter, a remote-controlled micro-air vehicle intended to deliver a listening device. An inability to maneuver in air currents doomed it to failure. Extreme Aircraft 2 will return on Modern Marvels. And now we turn to Extreme Aircraft 2 on Modern Marvels. For millions of American motorists, the daily commute looks and sounds like this. And the gridlock is predicted to worsen in the coming decades. If a growing community of aviation professionals gets their way, the daily commute could look more like this. These aerial automobiles are known as personal air vehicles or PAVs, and many hope that one day they will fill the skies. Personal air vehicle is really just what it says, personal air vehicle. So you are in control of where you go, and it's designed to be super simple, very reliable, so that grandmom and granddaddy will feel comfortable about getting in an airplane and flying uh, 50 miles or 100 miles to go see their grandchildren, you know, about like they would feel like getting in a car and driving across town. Today, the holy grail of personal air travel is vertical takeoff and landing, a flight mode that could make runways obsolete. Carter Aviation in Wichita Falls, Texas, dreams in the here and now. Its vision is the first practical vertical takeoff PAV. The original Carter Copter prototype first flew in 1998. It combines the best of helicopter and airplane, using a rotor for takeoff and landings, and then transitioning to high-speed fixed-wing flight. The Carter Copter's wingspan is 32 feet, and its rotor length is 45 feet. Max airspeed is 173 miles per hour. We think this aircraft that we've got with the rotor on top, which is always spinning, really acts like a parachute. So even if you lose an engine, even if you're 10 feet off the ground or 50 feet or whatever, you've got a built-in parachute that's gonna bring you down and land safely and softly. The Carter Copter is a so-called slowed rotor compound design. The large composite rotor blade has heavily weighted tips whose pitch is controlled by the pilot. On takeoff, the rotor is spun at high speed then the pilot increases the pitch. The rotor's inertia quickly lifts the aircraft off the ground. To make the transition to fixed wing flight, a pusher propeller engages as the rotor slows and uses the wind stream to keep it turning, decreasing the drag on the aircraft. For decades, aviation buffs dreamt of the flying car. In 1945, Robert Fulton Jr took flight in his Airphibian, the first certified rotable aircraft, meaning it could both fly and operate legally as an automobile. The vehicle could hit a top speed of 55 on the ground and 110 in the air. But the most famous winged automobile was the Aerocar, first built by Moulton Taylor in 1949. Taylor built three versions of the aircraft, with the third reaching a flight speed of 135 miles per hour. So 
what's our status here on this right here? This has been given heavy. Have you got the feet? Jay Carter has already begun construction on a four-seater version of his aircraft, known as the Four Place. A super lightweight, rigid body is crucial to its success. This is the uh, fuselage for our Four Place personal air vehicle. It's actually made in two parts that come apart. And I'll show you here how we push, pull this apart. The aircraft itself is actually completed. The inside of the fuselage is actually this part right here inside of the, uh, of the mold. And it's actually made in a composite construction and it's basically a layer of honeycomb with one layer of carbon on either side of it and uh, makes for an extremely strong lightweight structure. In fact, is this is what the honeycomb looks like. It's just paper honeycomb impregnated with resin. This is what the carbon fiber looks like. It's only 10 thousandths of an inch thick, just a little bit thicker than your hair. Once you impregnate that with resin and bond it on, now you've got a structure where this right here is lighter than aluminum and stronger than steel. Extremely efficient way to build an aircraft. But Carter's slowed rotor design certainly isn't the only way for a winged aircraft to achieve vertical liftoff. In 2005, the U.S. Marines began flying the V-22 Osprey, an aircraft that can quickly ferry troops to pinpoint locations. The Osprey is a tilt rotor, meaning its propellers engage downward for helicopter-like thrust during takeoff, and then rotate forward to become turboprops, much like a standard prop-driven aircraft. At Bell Helicopter in Arlington, Texas, the Bell Augusta 609 is the world's first civilian tilt rotor. The 609's wingspan is 34 feet, and the prop rotor spans 60 feet. The maximum airspeed is 316 miles per hour. It's a unique aircraft. It's uh, the only commercially developed aircraft that can take off and land vertically and fly up to 25,000 feet, more than 300 miles an hour. In pressurized comfort, land 700 miles away vertically again. So it really is a new way to fly. And um, you have a power lever here and you have a center stick. And just like in a helicopter with a collective, you pull up on this power lever and the aircraft will just come straight up in the air. The immediate thing you feel is acceleration. It actually kicks you back in your seat a little bit. And you start accelerating, start climbing out at a rather dramatic rate, I might add. The 609's purpose is point-to-point -point travel at speeds twice that of the fastest helicopter. With seating for up to nine passengers in a luxury cabin, it's a business commuter's dream. Integrating three onboard flight computers Designers built the 609 with safety and efficiency in mind. Despite its precise avionics and controls, pilots in training require a few sessions in the flight simulator. But who should apply for the captain's seat? Helicopter pilots or airplane pilots? If you're a helicopter pilot, it flies just like any other helicopter when you pick it up to a hover. And as an airplane pilot, when you turn it into an airplane, uh, you'd be very comfortable and right at home as an airplane. In the not so distant future, the 609 tilt rotor and a handful of personal air vehicles could become the extreme convenience aircraft for the casual traveler. Another extreme aircraft is hard at work fighting fires. This modified jumbo jet is king of the aerial fire trucks. Between 2000 and 2005, a NASA program sometimes called the Highway in the Sky developed navigation technologies for the projected future when personal air vehicles filled the skies. Extreme Aircraft 2 will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. We now return to Extreme Aircraft 2 on Modern Marvels.
In 2006, more than 96,000 fires charred nearly 9.9 million acres in the United States and cost a record $1.5 billion to fight. With human life and property at stake, having the right fire truck is critical. In Victorville, California, a converted DC-10 passenger jet called the 10-tanker air carrier claims the title of world's heaviest firefighting jet. The 10 tanker weighs in at 400,000 pounds fully loaded. The wingspan is 150 feet and max airspeed is 460 miles per hour. We're looking at the tank system, external, three tanks that carry a lot of fluid, 12,000 gallons, aerodynamic tank on each end. The technology was bought from Ericsson Air Crane, comes out through a computer controlled door down at the bottom, gives you the flow rate you want so that you get the coverage level you need on the ground. As you can see, they're hitched to the airplane with some very heavy structure. The airplane itself had to be modified so that that structure could bolt into a load carrying area of the airplane. The airplane was designed to have most of the weight inside. We've transferred a lot of the weight outside. The tanks are filled with either water or fire retardant. The retardant is simply water mixed with nitrogen, an effective fire suppressant that's slow to evaporate. Because the liquid is a dense 9.3 pounds per gallon, a full 12,000 gallon load weighs in at a staggering 60 tons. Getting that hefty payload airborne requires immense thrust. We've got three engines, each of which develop 40-some thousand pounds of thrust. And at the weights we're flying, in this case under 400,000 pounds, you get a very favorable thrust to weight ratio, even with a full load of retardant, which exceeds 100,000 pounds. The 10 tanker is the newest heavy lifter on the scene. But for the past half century, a wide assortment of aerial fire trucks has shouldered the load. That included many surplus World War II bombers and transports converted to firefighters in the late 1940s. By the 1960s, a variety of tanker aircraft built specifically to fight fires took over. Helicopters using buckets that could refill quickly from lakes or reservoirs became a favorite tool in the wildfire wars. California's 10 tanker is the heavy hitter many firefighters look to. When the crew is on call, the DC-10 can be filled and launched in less than an hour. It then approaches the firefighters and helps create a control line from which they battle an advancing wildfire. Air tanker itself doesn't put out fires. There's not an air tanker around that will, especially on large fires. But what this does is it allows them to work very closely to the line. They can build line, they can reinforce it. The pilot can control the density of the drop by adjusting altitude and varying the width of the opening on the tank doors. A typical 12,000 gallon drop from 250 feet covers an unbroken swath that's approximately 50 feet wide and three quarters of a mile long. To build a stronger, denser line, a pilot can increase flow rate for a swath that's approximately half a mile long. We can do it in a matter of minutes and seconds that it would take us hours to do with other aircraft. The DC-10 represents yet another attempt to apply extreme aircraft solutions to solve earthly problems. Applying breakthroughs in science to future aircraft is inevitable. Whether it's a flying fire extinguisher, a fighter, a bomber, a miniature spy plane, or an aerial commuter, our desire to dominate the skies will constantly redefine what extreme really means as we test the boundaries of the heavens.